Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Two good martinis again today, Jim. We are in such good moods and uh, we have actual good news to talk about, although this time uh, it's entirely due to the fact that the Democrats are either uh, incompetent or crazy in what they want to do legislatively. But hey, we'll take it. Uh, There is a a good spin to both of these. Let's start with the fact that once again, uh, just like uh, we saw to a large extent, at least while we still had troops in Afghanistan, the media is being fairly tough on Joe Biden. It's not as universal as uh, was happening with our ridiculously incompetent uh, pullout from Afghanistan. But when it comes to where Joe Biden is right now, especially with the cavalcade of terrible news he got towards the end of the week with the uh, the the wrong drone strike, innocent people killed, uh, the FDA shooting down the booster shots for people under 65, the French recalling their ambassador. This came up on uh, over the week on NBC, Willie Geist giving that whole litany of at least bad news for Biden uh, over to Chuck Todd as he gets ready to host Meet the Press. And Chuck Todd says, yeah, this president's got a real credibility problem. Well, look, I think he's got a a, a pretty big uh, credibility crisis on his hands because all of these problems in some ways showed up after he said something basically the exact opposite. Afghanistan withdrawal wasn't going to be messy. This wasn't going to look like Saigon. Uh, the booster shots, he came out and essentially said eight months and even indicated maybe we should start it as soon as five months. Now we're not sure if anybody under 65 is going to get a booster shot. Uh, so, you know, he's had and of course, the border has been, you know, whether this is, you could we can talk about the border problems. You could say there's years in the making, but the, the, it's pretty clear we have a bigger problem now than we've had in years. And this is a these policies have turned into becoming a magnet. There you go, Jim. You don't see uh, mainstream media talking a lot about how there's a competence and credibility problem with Democratic presidents. But when Chuck Todd says he's not only been wrong, he's actually been 180 degrees wrong because things are turning out exactly the opposite of what he promises. That is bad for Joe Biden. And uh, given the agenda that he's trying to push, that's good news for us. It is. Now, Greg, my first thought is if only someone had warned them uh, (laughs) that that Joe Biden was not this swell guy, an elder statesman, wise in foreign policy and just bursting at the gills with empathy. If only someone had said, hey, this guy's kind of been a hack his entire life and insecure and you know all kinds of shady family connections and and all that kind of stuff if only like some former president had said don't underestimate joe's ability to blank this up uh oh wait former president obama did say that in an interview uh or at least in discussions with other democrats um look i I think what makes this good uh as our martini today greg is that democrats and, and you know usually democratic friendly media are realizing they bought a lemon and they've driven it off the lot and they can't, you know, trade it in uh, with any degree, you know, any very quickly, anytime soon. Um, and I think what's more like because the presidency, because you only elect a president once every four years and because we've had so many two term presidencies, at least uh, since, you know, you and I were little kids, it's really kind of tough to measure um, an average because presidents are all different, right? They all bring different strengths and weaknesses to the table. And in the case of the Democrats, last two presidents, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, I, I don't, you know, you can disagree vehement with these, these guys, and I do, but I think you can recognize that it, when it came to the sheer matter of politics, both, you know, in terms of giving speeches, in terms of campaigning, in terms of charming people, in terms of getting people to feel good about them, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton were two masters. You know, two, the, the irony is they had two once in a generation talents in a span that's shorter than a generation, even those two men, those two men are uh, kind of, of, of considerably different ages. So Democrats got really used to having a president who whenever the, the public opinion was looking bad and all that stuff, could go out and give a big speech and probably do some good for that. Instead, we have a president President Biden did not address the media at all this past weekend. He did not uh, address anything until Monday afternoon. It was meetings uh, after the UN, Biden was speaking at the UN earlier today, um, not really getting rave reviews. And part of it is that he's talking about how much stronger our alliances are. 
when the French have recalled their ambassador and they're livid. The UK are okay, have signed on with the submarine deal, but they're kind of, uh, they are still smarting about Afghanistan and irked about this. Um, every major decision that the uh, administration is, oh, uh, the travel ban that they just, you know, undid, it sounds like the administration is doing a terrible job of just, you know, the warning phone call to our allies, keeping them in the loop, uh, saying, yeah, we're looking like we're going to reach this kind of direction, give them a chance to vent. And then hopefully when you actually make the announcement, they feel better about it. The Biden administration is doing a terrible job at this. You know, getting along with Boris Johnson and uh, uh, Macron and, and these other friends, like this, that's not the hard part, right? The other flip side of it is that we're not seeing any, you know, real response from Xi Jinping. Uh, I mean, if you look at the foreign leaders who are happiest with the Biden administration so far, Greg, it appears to be the Taliban. <laughs> uh, they're the most impressed with the job uh, Biden has done, and that's not particularly good for us. So I, it is kind of an, you know, like we've seen Bill Clinton get in trouble. We've seen Barack Obama get in trouble, but they always had these political gifts to go on. And we, I think it's pretty, you know, pretty clear. Biden's staff is hiding him from the media as much as possible. He doesn't take questions a lot. He goes out, he reads his speech off the teleprompter. It's not like anybody ever thought of Joe Biden being this amazing rousing speaker who you know could you know there's an argument of whether presidential speeches change anybody's mind at all but if you could joe biden's not the guy who's going to do that and he's just not a terribly effective communicator so every a whole bunch of things have gone you know things have gone wrong on the border things have gone wrong with inflation things have you know the problems are piling up and it's this geriatric slow-footed defensive that was four or five days ago um just just not talented guy who's got the job of turning around the ship and, you know, Democrats are suddenly realizing, whoa, we may have actually picked a really terrible guy. He's got real credibility issues. And the only way you can fix your credibility issues is by being more credible. And if there's anything we've learned about Joe Biden over the years, it's that he's going to be an extraordinarily stubborn human being. <laughs> That's right. And he'll say whatever he thinks he needs to say to try and get out of the moment, although he did promise in the first debate that he's never lied to the American people and he never would. So uh, that obviously hasn't come true. Uh, so, <laughs> Jim, I don't know if you watched his. My son never did anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> never. His whole life. Never. <laughs> I don't know if you watched his UN speech. I saw chunks of it. I didn't get to see the whole thing because you know I was getting ready for this because I have a job. Um, but there was, seemed to be a lot of Diplo speak mad libs. So basically just mushy platitudes in a lot of areas. Uh, There's a lot about climate change and COVID. There was one fleeting reference to Xinjiang, which was obviously a reference to the Uyghur genocide, but he never actually said Uyghur genocide or genocide or China. As far as I could tell anywhere in the speech, I could be wrong since I didn't hear the whole thing. But uh, as far as I can tell, he was uh, very, very soft on, uh, you know, the country that uh, could have done a whole lot more, at least to uh, mitigate the spread of the virus, if not directly responsible for the release of the virus. So, um uh, more weakness. Greg, more weakness. If, if we want to stop other pandemics, shouldn't we figure out how this one started? <laughs> that seemed like something you'd want to do, but uh, yeah, I guess it's like, yeah, we just, it's going to be an eternal mystery. We'll never know. Oh, well. So Jim, let's move from that good news into potentially even better good news. And those are the fantastic products you can get from Omaha Steaks. I have uh, had Omaha Steaks going back several years now. Love, love, love the steaks. Uh, I have had the burgers many times. Those are excellent as well. Love the au gratin potatoes on the side. Uh, they have desserts. It's uh, it's a full meal. It's not just meat, although the meat is excellent. And now you can get a jump on planning with easy, quality, delicious meals uh, when you're busy with work and school and that sort of thing. So go to omahasteaks.com and enter the code MARTINI into the search bar and order the deluxe grill out assortment. It includes over 30 entrees that you can share with your family. As I've said, my favorites are the burgers, the bacon wrapped filet mignon. I cannot put into words how delicious this is. I mean, just listen to those words in a sentence. You know, it's gotta be fantastic and it is. Plus you'll save over 50% and get 12 free burgers with this package and our code. Uh, the burgers, basically a steak between buns. Uh, you can get not only the bacon wrapped filet mignons, boneless chicken breasts, boneless pork chops, filet mignon burgers, gourmet jumbo franks, all beef meatballs, the size, the desserts. It's all fantastic. Visit omahasteaks.com, keyword martini, and save over 50% when you order the deluxe grill out assortment. Plus get the 12 free Omaha Steaks burgers and keep making memories with the ones you love. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword martini. All right, Jim, let's move on to our second good martini, which is the second bad martini for Biden. Politico has the headline today, Dems fear Biden's domestic agenda could implode. 
could is the operative word here. So that means it still could succeed, which would be, be definitely bad news. Uh, but here's what it says. Internal Democratic discord has wounded President Joe Biden's massive social spending plan, raising the prospect that the package could stall out, shrink dramatically, or even fail altogether. Myriad problems have arisen. Moderate Senate Democrats Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema continue to be a major headache for party leadership's $3.5 trillion target. The Senate parliamentarian just nixed the party's years-long push to enact broad immigration reform. House members may tank the prescription drugs overhaul the party has run on for years. And a fight continues to brew over Senator Bernie Sanders' push to expand Medicare. Quote, if any member of Congress is not concerned that this could fall apart, they need treatment, said Missouri Democratic Representative Emmanuel Cleaver, who warned his party, quote, will pay for it at the polls if it fails in enacting Biden's agenda. Quote, our caucus has the feeling of freedom to support or oppose leadership. Jim, <laughs> that's interesting he's got that take. I think if they go forward with the $3.5 trillion, a lot of this could end up blowing up in their face that way for their uh, midterm prospects. But obviously, that's all a very long way away. But uh, it's amazing how much political momentum ends up mattering on legislation and whether people feel the freedom to be picky about it or they need to uh, feel the whip to go along with what the leadership and the president wants them to do. Uh, given the president's weakness right now, you got a lot of people making demands, whether it's the progressives uh, in the House, whether it's the moderates in the Senate, and uh, hopefully Cleaver's right and all this does implode. I think at the heart of the Democrats' dilemma, besides the fact that they have very small majorities and they have put together this massive spending bill as if they had a big majority and that they could afford to alienate some segment of the centrists or purple, you know, district purple state uh, lawmakers, uh, that they didn't really need Joe Manchin, they didn't really need Kirsten Sinema, and lo and behold, it looks like they do. Um, but the other thing is that they've uh, also, you know, acted like they don't necessarily need, like, they, they're, you know, in a short version, is like their legislative agenda, to, to quote the cinematic classic Top Gun, <laughs> or to paraphrase it, their legislative agenda is writing checks that their legislative majorities cannot cash. Nice. Um, they, they just don't have the votes to do what they want to do. And the other nagging problem is, these are all things that have been on the Democratic wish list for a long time. You can look at a whole bunch of the agenda that they came to Washington uh, with, the, with the beginning of the year as being stuff that was either uh, longstanding yearning, Green New Deal, you know, or, you know, let's change the rules of the game so that we always win sort of proposals. Let's expand the size of the Supreme Court. Let's create senators for Puerto Rico. Let's create senators for District of Columbia. You know, all of these things were, you know, you and I would dispute that the country needs these things at all, but they're all kind of like nice to haves. They're all things that would be, you know, you'd like to have, not things you necessarily need. A secure border is something you need uh, as you look at, you know, the scenes in Del Rio. Um, getting inflation under control is something you need because, you know, even if you're lucky, if we can get good wage growth, if the cost of goods and services is going up faster than the wages, that's not helping anybody on the lower rungs, the ladder, get ahead in life, right? Um, well, so, you know, like this, this design, I'm, after we finish this, I'm going to go tape the editors. My colleague, Charlie Cook, you know, he's very much a, he wants zero spending. Uh, from this. He doesn't want the bipartisan infrastructure deal. He doesn't want any of this stuff. And it is kind of interesting. We're coming out of the pandemic in which we, a year in which we've spent more money than ever before by a wide margin, not even close. And the the attitude of the administration is the biggest problem facing the country is we're not spending enough money. I don't think that's how Americans feel. I, I, I So the first thing is that they're fighting over this thing, convinced that there's going to be this giant political bonanza, this giant pot of gold at the end of the at the end of the rainbow. Now remember, they spent the COVID relief bill, you know, relatively early on, and that did not create a significant, uh, uh, you know, boost in the numbers. Look at the numbers on COVID, you look at the president's numbers on Afghanistan. The, what the people feel about you is really about what's going on front and center of them. They don't care what you did six months ago. They don't care what you did eight months ago. And the idea of, oh, don't worry, someday we're gonna pass this massive new spending bill and it's gonna make you feel happy. People can't think about that. They're not going to think about that. All they're going to think about is what they're seeing on their television or in the case of Afghanistan, what they're not seeing on their television anymore. Um, but, you know, COVID restrictions, the fact that the economy is not back where it should be, things like that. So this is all kind of, you know, separated from it. And even you know, the week, month by month, the inflation numbers are the sort of thing that make the Joe Manchin of the world even more reluctant. He explicitly said it this past week. I'm not sure we should be passing this giant spending bill this year until we know we've got inflation under control. Otherwise, just putting a huge bunch, huge chunk of new government spending is just pumping more money into the economy. 
with not nearly as much goods and services to chase that. So this is actually going to exacerbate the problem of inflation. So again, it's all been whistling past the graveyard, and now they're deep in the graveyard. Now, now they are really you know, in the mess. It, it is now you know, crunch time, and they don't necessarily have the votes. And look, if they don't have this, this is one of the problems of when you decide to put almost your entire domestic agenda, shove it into one bill, and hope that your extraordinary meager majorities can somehow figure out a way to ram the whole thing through. Yeah, it's it's politically dumb, but of course they know they have the media on their side, so they're going to cajole and berate the cinemas and mansions and any uh, House members who don't toe the line on this, and we'll see if it works. Uh, Cinema and mansion don't seem to be budging, at least on the big number at this point. Just yesterday, Jim, we were talking about... um, how the Republicans, if they were smart, and while Manchin is delaying this, uh, start talking about some of the really unpopular provisions that are in this bill. And here's one that I came across yesterday that I didn't know about before. And that's how much the Democrats want the IRS poking into every little bit of your life. Uh, There's a debate going on about whether the IRS should be able to look into any account of any American with at least $600 in inflow or outflow in the year. So most accounts, uh, and whether or not, uh, you know, you're uh, shifting money from one account to the other or or putting money in an overseas account. WFAA uh, television in Dallas looked into this. They found that it was true. And here's what they discovered. Back on June 8th, in a testimony to the Senate Finance Committee, IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick lays out what would be included in the plan. You can see here, financial institutions would be responsible for reporting your withdrawals and deposits, breaking down physical cash, transactions with a foreign account, and transfers to and from another account with the same owner. Now, this would apply to all business and personal accounts with at least $600 in it. According to the testimony, the purpose of this plan would be to improve tax administration and provide the IRS with a blueprint to address various facets of the tax gap. So we can verify, yes, it is true that under President Biden's proposed legislation, the IRS would have access to more information on accounts with more than $600 in them. So there you go, Jim. Everybody loves the IRS uh, poking around. They say it's to make sure that nobody's uh, gaming the tax system. That's what the Democrats say. But, uh, you know, for anybody who moves money from savings into checking or vice versa, the IRS is going to be all over that because the banks will have to report it now. So uh, if you want more government into every little financial detail of your life, this is the legislation for you. You know, Greg, uh, to quote the president, this was four or five days ago. Um <laughs> Listeners know what big fans of the bulwark we are. <laughs> oh, One of the dullest butter knives in the drawer over there, Jim Swift, uh, wrote something that basically said, of course, Republicans are opposing this. Republicans support tax fraud. The only reason anyone could object to this is if you're in, if you're committing tax fraud or you want to protect those who are committing tax fraud. And that's what Republicans are all about. And um I have, in fact, I mentioned him a second time in this podcast. I have great respect for my colleague, Charlie Cook. Charlie doesn't get angry easily, but every once in a while, like he brings out, I'm not sure if the, the, the A-bomb is the right metaphor. Uh, considering his roots, we probably should think of, you know, some, some great British battleship or something like that. And he just leveled the guns at Jim Swift. And he just laid out what a stupid way of thinking this is. And how basically, this is basically, well, if you, unless you're guilty, you have no reason to not agree to everything the police want. Uh, only people who are committing crimes would not allow the police to search their house without a warrant. Only people who are guilty wouldn't answer, uh, would want a, a lawyer present when the police are questioning them. Only people who are guilty of crimes would want to limit the, the scope and size and power of the government. And this is just absolutely moronic and probably the ultimate example of how bad an argument this was, was that Charlie Sykes, who's, if he's not the editor over there, he's one of the high ranking people at the Bulwark, read Charlie Cook's just, you know, just just giving him a, uh, a wedgie and taking his lunch money, just, you know, this absolute you know, devour, devouring of Jim Swift. And uh, Charlie Sykes retweeted and said, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Jim Swift, look out for that bus. Oh, oh, man, he's he's going to be feeling that one in the morning. Yeah, every once in a while, I feel like Charlie Sykes is throwing out hostage signs over there. But uh, <laughs> like on HR1, he had uh, kind of disagree with uh, Bill Crystal and the rest of them. But uh, yeah, not a lot of sympathy for the bulwark. They've gone. Uh, I don't know where they've gone, but it's nowhere near conservatism. It's just a lot of the not time. to our taste, Greg. That's all we're going <laughs> to gently put it. You know? 
Yeah, it, that, there's a lot of good examples you just uh, gave there from Charlie's piece. It also reminds me back in the day when Lindsey Graham was saying that uh, if you have any problem with the uh, the TSA nudie scans or the uh, the uh, over the clothes molestation, it's because you have something to hide when you're going through the airport. Uh, no. No, I just happen to not like being groped or uh, going through the scanner as I uh, try to take a flight. All right, now that we've offended uh, all sorts of swaths in the Republican Party, let's uh, let's uh, head on to our next wonderful sponsor here, and uh, that would be the good folks over at Ernest. Look, you don't need Joe Biden's free quote unquote community college or whatever debt relief they're going to uh, try to put out there, which is not going to bring college costs down. In fact, it's going to make them probably go up. But if you have current student loan debt that you're dealing with, take a good look at Earnest because with today's low interest rates, it's a great time to refinance your student loans. Times are tough. We realize that. But worrying about your student loan payments doesn't make things any easier. And that's where refinancing with Earnest could help. So say goodbye to stressful student loan payments and take charge of your future with Earnest. Earnest offers low rate student loan refinancing, and you can check your rate risk free in just two minutes. With Earnest, you get radically flexible payments and you can pick your loan term. By refinancing, you can reduce your loan term, save money, or combine multiple loans to a simple monthly payment. And if you have questions, you can even talk to a real live human being at Earnest for help. Now, isn't it time you stopped feeling overwhelmed by your student debt? And right now, Ernest is offering Three Martini Lunch listeners a $100 bonus. Refinance your student loans at earnest.com slash martini. Terms and conditions apply. Once again, you get a $100 cash bonus when you visit earnest.com slash martini to refinance your student loan. It's not available in all states and terms and conditions apply as does this legal information. Earnest Student Loan Refinancing made by Earnest Operations, LLC, NMLS, number 1204917, California Financing Law, license number 6054788, 535 Mission Street, San Francisco, California, 94105. Visit earnest.com slash licenses for a full list of licenses. All right, Jim, on to our crazy martini now. And there was stiff competition for the crazy martini today. But congratulations to White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki for coming out on top with the craziest uh, moment of the last 24 hours. And this was her uh, comment at the White House briefing yesterday under questioning from Fox News White House correspondent Peter Ducey. Uh, where the uh, the news had just broken that they were going to ease restrictions on Europeans traveling into the United States, provided they are vaccinated. They have to show proof that they're vaccinated. I'm not sure if there's an opt-out for a negative COVID test or not. There might be. And so Ducey says, okay, so that's the policy for people flying in from Europe. What about all these people at the border? Yeah, we've been talking about Del Rio, but of course there's you know hundreds of thousands coming across every month, not just uh, these Haitians that are currently gathered there, although they're included in this question, do they have to prove that they are vaccinated or have a negative COVID test? And Saki fires back with this. First of all, I can re, re, I can readdress for you or re talk you through what that steps the, we that take. That is the policy for people who fly into the country. So if somebody walks into the country right across the river, does somebody ask them to see their vaccination card? Well, let me explain to you again, Peter, how our process works. As individuals, as individuals come across the border, uh, and uh, they are uh, both assessed for whether they have uh, any symptoms. If they have symptoms, they are the intention is for them to be quarantined. That is our process. They're not intending to stay here for a lengthy period of time. I don't think it's What's the same here? thing. The it's not the same thing. So, Jim, um, I mean, there's lying, there's spin. I don't know where exactly this falls, but Jen Psaki claiming that people visiting from Europe are staying longer than people coming to the border illegally. Is she asking us to believe something that's patently not true? Is this another example of them thinking we're stupid? Or does she just have no idea what she's talking about? I was going to say, it's now pretty clear that Jen Psaki gets up there and just says the first thing that pops into her mind. <laughs> whether or not it's actually connected to what the policy is, whether or not it really makes a persuasive argument, or in this case, whether it makes any sense at all. Because, you know, first of all, if you want to know the, the full scoop on just how many uh, American families have not been able to see their relatives, you can read Ellen Carmichael, my colleague Michael Brennan Doherty talked a bit about uh, having to go over to the difficulty of getting his, his kids go over to see their grandfather in Ireland, you know. 
Um, you know, yes, we, we need, you know, take proper health precautions, but you kind of figured once people started getting vaccinated, traveling from one country to another would be a lot easier. And it wasn't for months and months. And nobody really had a good explanation of why the administration was holding to this stance. Um, you know, so, you know, th there's been that. But the other thing is that, look, folks who sneak across the border, nobody's COVID testing them, right? You know, it's all depending on them. We're putting them into these giant uh, camps when we can find them. In the case of Del Rio, it just is a, you know, open air uh, they're just trying to contain it. It seems like um, that's no one's testing them. No, and of course, the, the policy for a lot of these cases is catch and release. So under what circumstances somebody who comes to America because they want to go to Disneyland for a week, you know, oh, they're staying here a long time. We got to be real careful. Uh, I can't you know, let them. But the migrants who are coming across the border who clearly want to stay here, they're not looking for seasonal work. You know, the, I don't think the Haitians are like, no, I'm going to catch the first flight back as soon as I can. You know, clearly they're coming here for the long term. So the entire logic of this, oh, you know, we'd want to check, we, we want to, we want to check the people who are here for a long time, but not the people who are here for a short time. But first of all, like, did the virus get a memo that it's not dangerous if it's only going to be in somebody who's here for a short period of time? So again, none of this makes sense. It's absolutely ridiculous. And she's getting a little bit of grief and pushback on this, but nearly enough. I think the bigger point here is that the administration is in a really bad spot with this, the, the, the crisis on the border. It's now been like, five, six consecutive months of this, so, you know, back in the spring, um, there was this insistence of, uh, oh, this is a seasonal pattern. Look, the numbers never went down. It never got back. Why These Haitians have been in Central America for a long time. They've been in years in some cases. Why are they coming now? Because they've gotten the message. The border is open. Lo and behold, Kamala Harris going down in Central America and saying, don't come, didn't affect anybody's decision making wasn't forceful enough. And here's the thing, the only thing that really makes people decide to not try to get across the border is a clear, consistent message followed up by action that you're not gonna be allowed to stay in this country. And the more Biden talks up about needing and wanting to get a path to citizenship, the more it becomes clear people wanna get in to make sure they get a taste of that amnesty. And yesterday, Secretary Mayorkas, Homeland Security, said the border is not open, Jim. Not open. Uh, the facts would seem to suggest otherwise when they're even saying, uh, as it relates to Del Rio, family units are probably going to get to stay until they're adjudicated if they even show up for the hearings. And that's certainly been the case um, uh, in other parts of the border sector as well. So the idea that the border is not open effectively uh, is just ludicrous. But uh, they're blowing a lot of smoke and uh, we'll see how many people actually uh, actually believe it. They're blowing a lot of smoke, Greg. And these are the same people who lecture us about carbon emissions. <laughs> Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, really glad to have you with us. Please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends about us as well. Always very, very grateful for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday and please join us on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.